Lucky you. So how do we design Accenture Connections? What techniques are we using in this class? First of all, are we using elastic or inelastic techniques? <laughs> inelastic. Inelastic techniques. That's good. So what do we do? Use a table in the book. Good answer. Use a table in the book. Um, how does the bolt table work? What do you do? Not everybody answered at once. That's right. So next time, hit your button. That was a really good answer. And cyberspace missed out. Okay. Um, <laughs> use your geometry, right? You use the number of bolts you have, the spacing between the bolts, the eccentricity between the center and stiffness, and the and and the load. You use all these things to kind of plug into these tables, and you come out with a magic number, right? And that magic number is the equivalent number of bolts if they were loaded concentrically, right? Great. Then what do you do with that number? You multiply by your bolt capacity, right? What are the two bolt capacities we usually look at? Shear failure. What's the other one? Baron and tearing, right? Right? We have to decide which one controls. Great. Hey, how does the weld table work? The exact same way. Yes. Geometry is a little bit different. Things are a little bit different. Not that hard, though. You plug in, you get numbers out. But you plug into this equation when you use the, uh, the welds. So what's, what's my fee factor for the welds? 1.75. What is C? It actually comes out of the table, right? It's the number that comes from the table. What's C1? That's right, the electro thing out of the table for the other table. Great answer, very thorough. Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a factor that takes into account that not all electrodes are the same strength, and also not all electrodes are the same ductility. That's real important to know, to understand why, not just it's the thing before the other table. Okay? Okay, what's D? The leg height in sixteenths of an inch. So if I have a three sixteenths inch weld, what's D? Trace. Right? That's for the Spanish speaking in the audience, right? Trace. Three. Right? What's L? It's an international class, right? What's L? The length of the weld in inches, right? Inches. Inches, 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 inches. Okay, if someone ever gives you something in not inches, not U.S. standard units, I would transfer them, use the table, and transfer back. All right? Okay, I'm not going to do that to you though. So, oh, is this an eccentric connection? Oh, what a great answer! What a great answer! The answer is it depends, right? It depends. As you look at it, you would say, well, the center of stiffness is here, right? Right? So you'd think it would be concentric. But we, we're not necessarily looking at the side. If our eye was here on the side and we saw something that looked like this. Hey. That's the same, isn't it? It's the same. This is the handout I gave before. Everyone should have this. It's the same, and yet there's an eccentricity in this direction, isn't there? So I'll ask the question again, is this an eccentric connection? If that's what it looks like, then yes it is. Even better answer. Very good. Yes, that's an eccentric connection. And this could be. You'd have to look at the side, right? You'd have to look at the side to know. Okay, so yes, these are eccentric connections. Now, are these different? Are the, stre are the stresses different on these connections than the ones previously? Think about the bolts. Think about taking those loads, 
deconvoluting them. The stress is going to be different? Yeah. Previously, what did we have? We had shear and what else? What's that? Torsion. Torsion. Very good. Okay, and what do we have here? Shear and... And tension and compression. Bending, in a sense. Right? Bending, in a sense. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, you're going to have shear and tension. Actually, let's go ahead and do that right now. So what's the free body diagram going to look like for these bolts? What's it going to look like? What stresses? What loads? Being able to do things like this is the key to this class, all right? Tension loads on the top. I love that. Very good. So I'm going to draw those out like that. How about the next bolt? I, I would expect it to be because the center of stiffness of the connection is probably here, isn't it? We could almost think of that as like the neutral axis in bending for a member. So wouldn't you expect this, this bolt to be in tension? Yeah. What do you think the value will be? The same as this? It, was sh it should be less than, shouldn't it? Why? It's closer to the neutral axis. It's closer to the neutral axis. It's exactly right. Smaller. Oh, okay. How about the bolts below? What do you think? Compression. Compression. Don't you think? Think they'll be the same magnitude in opposite direction, right? Compression. Compression. Okay. Are we done? What? Something. You gotta do your forces up. That's right. What are they? What are those called? Shear. Very good. Very, very good. Okay, now does everyone see that this top bolt is simultaneously in tension and shear? Right? And the bottom bolt's in compression and shear. Now, do you, do you remember? This is a tough question. I know the answer I usually get, so we'll see what you guys give me. Do you remember ever looking at members or elements or whatever that are under combined loading, under combined tension and shear? Hmm. I hope so. How do you do that? Now, first I'll ask the question, would you expect a member that has tension, high amounts of tension and high amounts of shear to have the same capacity as the member that would only have shear. Do you think that bolt will be as strong? It doesn't make sense that it would, does it? I mean if you're, do, if you're asking something to do a whole lot it's not as strong, right? It's not as strong to take on more, right? I think we've all seen that in our everyday lives and things like that. I didn't remember how to take that into account. More circle. It happens to be on the page, right? Right? And yeah, that's the answer. More circle. Okay, if you don't remember what more circle is, you better open up Strength and Materials book. Okay? You better read it. Okay? You have a hole in your education that you need to fill. Okay? That I'm going to expect you to understand and know. So the top and bottom bolts in tension and shear, if the bolt is highly stressed in tension, then we would not expect it to have the same shear capacity. Recall more circle from strength and materials, and what more circle is all about is that you have a failure plane, a failure surface, a limit in a sense, right? And you plotted, you had this limit, this capacity, and you would plot what your shear stress is, and you would plot what your tensile stress is, and you would go and you would see if you were inside the failure plane, what's that mean? <coughs> Yay! That's good if you're inside. It didn't fail. If you're outside, not so good. Right? Not so good. More circle can sometimes be helpful to help you decide what strength of materials you need. <coughs> okay? Because oftentimes the tensile capacity and the shear capacity are tied to one another. What? 
If I know the tensile capacity of something, what is a good estimate of the shear capacity? Who remembers? 0.6. Okay? 0.6. Very good. So what's helpful is I can plot a tensile and a shear capacity, and it can help me decide what material I need. Okay? That'll be strong enough with this combination of materials. Now, when we did more circle, we drew circles, and I think that's just because... Moore did circles in the past, and he did things like this was tension, tension, and this was compression, compression, and this was tension, compression, and compression, tension, depending on what the state of stresses are. You know what? I get confused when I do that stuff. I can't remember what coordinate system is what. It, it's just a mess. And you know what? I think Moore wouldn't, wouldn't, have cons wouldn't have been concerned about details. And we often like to take points off if people don't get things in the, in the right vectors, in the right, in the right coordinate system, in, in, in strength of materials, but we're not going to worry about it in this class because all we really care about is one quadrant of that circle. Okay, We only really care about one quadrant of the circle, and we will only be using one quadrant. Now, it's a little strange. We're going to do things a little bit differently than Moore's. Moore's always plotted tensile capacity on the x-axis, and they plotted shear capacity on the y-axis. We're going to do them backwards. Why? Because that's the way AASC presents them. Okay? Because I'm just following, I'm just passing their error on to you. Okay? That's all I'm doing. All right? Okay? So we, we could see that if I could cover these up, since it is a circle, that I, I could get away with only using one quadrant. Does that make sense? Yeah? Are you okay with that? Yeah? All right. Okay, we don't need the whole circle. We only need one quadrant. Also recall that our shear capacity is 0.6 of our tensile capacity. Therefore, this is important. This is very important. Therefore, we actually get an ellipse instead of a circle. We actually get an ellipse. If, if, if we take this quadrant, we plot it down here. And if we say this value is Fu or the tensile capacity, okay? Then we would say that this value is going to be equal to what? 0.6 of it, isn't it? Now, if this is a circle, circles have constant radii, right? Okay? If this is Fu, then we would, we, this would have to be Fu out here, wouldn't it? Right? But that's not the way it is. It's not nature. It's not the way it works. So it's only 0.6. So it's just a moder. it's just a... A, 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 a modification of Moore's circle to be Moore's ellipse. All right? You okay with that? Okay. And, and here's the equation. Here is the equation for Moore's ellipse. Okay? And you could actually use this equation. What you're going to do is you're going to take what your load and tension is, and you're going to divide it by the tensile capacity, and you're going to take your load and shear and you're going to divide by the shear capacity. You're going to square this one. You're going to square this one. It has to be less than or equal to 1. Now, you will see throughout your structural engineering career, especially if you take things like um, earthquake engineering, um, where they will do things like this to deconvolute stresses. Okay? This is a, this is a common technique to take into account shear stresses and simultaneously tension or compression stresses, all right? It's not necessarily the best technique, or if you go and do lots and lots of math or finite element modeling, you'll find that it's not necessarily the best, but it is the conservative. It's conservative in, and boy, it's pretty easy to use, isn't it? Okay? Pretty easy equation. But believe it or not, AISC feels that you can't handle this equation. They don't think you can do this, and that's not totally right. I'm, I'm being a little harsh on them. But they, they don't want to have an equation like this in their manual. And I'll tell you why here in a second. And the way AISC handles this ellipse is they actually break it up into three linear lines. Okay, so we're making a couple jumps here. And I hope you're with me. Because if you get lost on one of these jumps, I'm going to keep jumping. And you're going to be behind. Okay? So if you've got questions, now is a great time to... Ask them and we'll slow down. We'll do our best to answer them. But just to summarize again, we started out taking, we have tension and shear simultaneously. We started out trying to use Moore's circle, but then we modified it to be Moore's ellipse. 
right? Because the tensile capacity and shear capacity were not the same. We got an equation for, um, um, pardon me, we got an equation right here for Moore's ellipse. And then AAC says, you know what? The ellipse is too complicated. And we are going to idealize it as three lines. A flat line till point three of the shear strength. It's just flat. You can, you can use the full tensile capacity of the bolt if the shear capacity is less than 30%. Same thing down here. We have a flat line. We can take into account the full shear capacity of a bolt, full shear capacity of a bolt, as long as it's less, it's loaded less than 30% of the tensile capacity. You okay with that? Okay. And then we're going to hook them together with a linear line. Call this a trilinear plot. Okay? It's flat, it's flat, and it's linear in the middle. And you use this equation. If either your shear stress or your tensile stress is greater than 30%, use this equation to calculate and see if you're okay or not, right? Because what happens if your point, let's say I plug in all my numbers here, my data point's right here. What's that mean? Outside of the circle, what's that mean? Failure. So how do I fix it? I can either increase the number of bolts, Increase the capacity or decrease the load. Good luck on the last one. Okay? You with me? Great. Now, why does AISC do this? Why do they do this? I mean, we've, we've all done lots of math in our lives. And we can easily handle an equation like this. I mean, it's... This equation, in some ways, is much more elegant than this trilinear equation, in some ways. Because you just plug right in. You don't have to think. Right? Just plug right into the equation. See what it says. Are you good or are you not? But there's something else that trumps that. What is it? Well, if you had this equation, if you required your designers, every single time there was any eensy bit of tension that they had to use this equation, or if any time there was eensy bit of shear and, they, and, and yet a, a dominant amount of, of tension, you would have to do a whole lot of calculations about things that don't really mean anything because real life connections all have shear and tension in them. All. Even if they're predominantly shear, they'll have some tension. Even if they're predominantly tension, they'll have some shear. They all do. That means you'd have to do this equation every single time you wanted to do a calculation. And you know what? We're learning about this in the graduate class, right? Graduate class. A lot of people don't get to take this class in their career, yet they're still expected to design steel. Okay? So think about all the explanation. I'd have to, under, I'd have to explain the centric connections and go through all these things. I mean, I could do it. I'm, I'm, I'm a big boy. I, I, can, I can make it happen, you know. No worries. But, you know, maybe other people couldn't. I don't know. But they, they'd have to explain all this stuff to basically say, you know what, 90% of the time, you're going to be here or you're going to be here. 90% of the time, you don't really need this equation. You're only going to need it in situations like this. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing in this class. We're, we're going to be actually solving for what these stresses are, or loads, okay? And the tensile loads, where are they going to go? FT. Capacities are going to go down here. Shears are going to go up here. Capacities are going to go down here. You're going to actually look and see if, if either one of these is lower than 0.3. You 
can just use the capacity of the other one. You can just compare and see if that other ratio is less than or equal to one. It's kind of weird what I just said. I think it'll make more sense when you do some math or if it doesn't make any sense at all, think about the graph. Think about the graph. Am I here, 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 or here? Where am I? And if I'm here or here, I can use the full capacity and in, intention. In if I'm here or here, I can use the, um, I'm sorry, if I'm here or here, I can use the full capacity and tension. If I'm here or here, I can use the full capacity and shear. And it's only when I'm here is when I have to look at the combination. Okay. I think it'll make more sense once you start to play with it and start, start working with it. But if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. No questions. Okay, so now let's talk about welds. What do you think about welds? Are they going to be the same? No. It would be too easy if they were the same. Let's talk about why they're not the same. The previous method works well for bolts because bolts are discrete connectors. What does that mean? That's right. Through all the load is transferred at one point. Discrete connectors that are capable of some slip and yielding. Welds are different. They are continuous connectors and almost always create a fixed connection. Rotation equals zero. And our next topics we're going to be talking about are what's a fix versus a pin. And in my undergrad class, hopefully you've seen this before in your life, you've seen some pictures of what's a fixed versus a pin, versus a pin connection. Now we're going to come up with mathematical descriptions of fixed first pin connections. Okay? Ugh. It's just so much easier to look. Okay? Because all that stuff I taught you before is right. Okay? Okay. So, there are continuous connectors and almost always create a fixed connection. That's a rotation equal to zero. Because of this, the stress distribution looks like this. Okay, so if I have the same connection we we're talking about, is this an eccentric connection? Yes, it is. The shear stress diagram is going to look like this. You agree with me? VQ over IB. It's just like a shear, shear distribution on a, uh, on a web of a W shape. It's going to look just like that. There will be no shear at the top, highest amount of shear in the middle, intermediate amount of, amount of shear at, at B. Bending diagram is going to look just like this, right? Tension up here, compression down at the bottom. Right? Yeah? Now, the cool thing here is the kind of thing that's kind of wild is that let's notice that at point A, what's our shear stress? Come on, you guys are smart. What is it? Zero. Zero. What's our tension stress? Maximum. Right? Okay? So if we plotted it, and I'm drawing it here, it doesn't necessarily have to be here. It's, 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 it's around there, right? It's not outside the window, right? It's not outside the vector, right? The, 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 the edge, the surface, right? Okay? It's somewhere in there, right? Yeah? Okay? Now let's look at C. <coughs> What's the tension and compression stress? Zero. What's the shear stress? Maximum. Okay? Let's do the same thing. Well, we're, we're around here, aren't we? High amount of shear, low amount of tension. Now, what's going to happen as I move in the middle? What's going to happen at B? What kind of shear stress do I have? The middle. <laughs> what kind of tension stress do I have? The middle. So we're going to be somewhere in here, aren't we? Yeah? So guess what? We can actually draw a line. We can draw a line from here to here. And what do we notice about this line? As long as our extremes, the point at C and the point at A, are within our bounds, what can we say about B? It's within our bounds. It has to be. 
So is this diagram helpful anymore? What does this diagram do? What is it good for? Torture. What else is it good for? Bolts. What'd you say? Robots. Robots? No. Take into account that we have simultaneous amounts of high shear and high tension. Right? That's what this is for. Guaranteed to be on your exam. Okay? This is to take into account we have simultaneous high amounts of shear and tension. Okay? Now, the good thing we've just proven is that we're not able to have high simultaneous shear and tension. It's not going to happen. Doesn't matter. It's not going to control. So what's that mean? It means we don't need this chart for welds. Be a little careful though. You don't need this chart for continuous welds. We'll talk about stitch welding coming up. You don't need it for continuous welds. Notice that where our shear stresses are low, our bending stresses are high and vice versa. This means that we don't have the same concerns of reducing the capacity of the welds. Again, guaranteed that's going to be on the exam. This allows us to use the same inelastic methods we used previously for eccentric connections. I'm going to say that again. When we were designing bolts like this, how do we take into account high tension and high shear? How do we take into account high tension and high shear? The funny chart. I like that. Moore's ellipse, right? Now, how do we take into account if it's loaded like this? Well, that's simultaneous shear and torsion. Yes? The stresses are in the same plane, aren't they? Aren't they? Oh man, this is going to be a good test question. I can see it now. Oh, baby, it's going to be awesome. Stresses are in the same plane. Are stresses in the same plane here? No. Some are going this direction, some are going out of the dire at another direction. So when we work these type problems, what do we use? The charts. Shear and tension. I'm sorry, shear and torsion. When we work problems like this, we use Moore's ellipse, right? Now, the cool thing is with welds, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I use. It doesn't matter, well, it matters what I use, but it doesn't matter if I've got, let's say I have a W shape or a box, okay? And I'm loading right there. It doesn't matter if I'm loading it like this or like this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I still use the tables in the book. Why is that? Great possible future question. Because we're, we do not, the shear stresses and bending stresses don't add. So in a sense, we're just looking at where the, either the bending stresses are high or where the shear stresses are high. And the tables in the book do that. Do that very well. This means we don't have the same concerns of reducing the capacity of our welds, well, at least not in the same way. This allows us to use the same inelastic methods we used previously for eccentric connections and only focus of the failure of the welds in either tension or shear, not the combination. This lets us treat the problem just like we did previously 
and use table 8, 4 through 8, 11. And believe it or not, on table 8, 4, La la la. La, la, la. la 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 They show they show I don't know if you haven't noticed this before, but those are the problems we've done previously. Probably not because I haven't I haven't made you do homework yet. So no one ever studies anything that you have to do homework, right? I know how that works. Okay, we loaded it like this and and it was it was something with an S with the, the eccentricity coming um, perpendicular to the welds. We're in the same plane as the welds. But look, this is showing a 3D drawing with the eccentricity not in the same planes as, as the welds. And they say you can use the same table. Now, is this okay with bolts? Is this okay with bolts? No. But it is for welds. And we've talked about why several times. Fabulous future test question. And we do everything else the same. We look at our angles. We can do our interpolation, all that jazz. Same thing with the angles. We're going to use the most conservative one. Okay. Pretty clear world now, right? Consents? Kind of clear. Now, here comes the uh-oh. Depends. Now, welds are not always continuous. Occasionally, and actually commonly, especially on long welds, people like to use stitch welding. Okay? Especially on long connections. <coughs> Occasionally, stitch welds are used. And how would this change the way we design welds? Well, every single time, the easiest way to solve every question in this class is to go back to first principles and think about what's the stress distribution. And then how do I handle that stress distribution? Okay? So, we'll do this one together. But there's going to be some fun homework questions coming up. Okay? So I load it like this. What's the shear stress is going to look like? Okay. What's the shear stress here going to be? How'd you know? There's no weld there. Okay. What do you think is going to be here? That's what nobody knows. What's it going to be? Oh, no. I don't hate that. I, I, it's going to look something like that, isn't it? And it's going to look something like that. And what people like to do, Jacob, is they like to say that that's about this. Okay? But that's wrong. Okay, that's, that's not wrong, but that's a simplification. And we are still talking mechanics, okay? Okay? So how about what's the bending stress is going to look like? Okay, well, let's talk about the top. Where's the neutral axis at? Or where's the center of stiffness? We've done a center of stiffness calculation. Remember how we did that? That Y bar, we have that A, X over A that we did for each one. One could do that if one wanted to for this problem. But I can tell you by inspection it's going to be dead in the center between those two wells, isn't it? I mean, maybe it would help you to think about these these welds being so short as if they are discrete connectors or as if they are bolts. So now, if that's my neutral axis and I come over here, I dot it out, what do you think my stress is going to look like here? Compression or tension? Tension. Hopefully you got that one right. Okay. Theoretically, it's going to look something like that. Depending on the size of the weld, we may think of that as just like a block. 
and people would probably like, just like to think about it in terms of a load, and that's fine. There's no problem with that. Okay. What's it going to look like down here? Compression. Now, do we care about welds and compression? Can welds fail in compression? Have you ever done the calcs on welds and compression before? No. Now, I don't think they're going to fail in compression. Or if they do, then you got other, way other issues going on. Something else is going to go first, okay, before a weld's going to fail in compression. So we're, we're actually not so worried about this weld, are we? But we are with this one. Now, this case we're going to have shear and we're going to have tension simultaneously. How do we handle problems where we have shear and tension simultaneously? Moore's ellipse is the answer. But I just said that you didn't need to use Moore's ellipse for welds. I'm a liar. What's different? It's continuous versus discrete, right? These are discrete connectors, right? Well, let's go back and say that in a different way. The stresses dictate that there are high shear and high tension. And because of that, we're going to have to use Moore's ellipse. How do you do that? It's not very hard. Shear stress, I mean, hopefully you guys can all come up with what these values are going to be. And this is going to be V over 2 and V over 2, right? You can come up with some kind of couple here. Statics, right? It's equivalent to the external moment. External moment? How do I get the external moment? P times E. Great. Because of the differences from our previous analysis, shear and tension stress is high in the same location. We are not able to use the weld tables 8, 4 through 8, 11. Instead, we have to work the problem like we did with both, with Moore's ellipse. Okay? Any questions? No questions? Who's sleeping? Jennifer, you can raise your hand. Come on. Too slow. Any questions? Because I'm just going to keep on going. Okay. Connections. So we've been talking about connections in shear and tension. Let me tell you, there's, this is going to be our, I, th I believe, this is going to be our last topic we cover before our first exam. Okay? There's probably going to be two more homework assignments. One more over eccentric connections and one more over these type, this type of analysis. And then... It's test time, okay? So it's time to get this stuff figured out. Connections. We've been talking about connections in shear and tension. These concepts are useful in trusses and other miscellaneous connections, but now let's focus on beam, beam type connections. Recall that the fixity of a connection determines the moment distribution. Load is distributed by stiffness, at least in the elastic range. So what I mean by this is if I have structures, I've got a simply supported structure, and I've got what we call a fully restrained structure. Okay? And let's just and then we've got something in the middle that's a partially restrained structure. What's that mean? Not quite pin and not quite fixed. And we call them springs, rotational springs. Anyone ever seen a rotational spring? This is a picture from a 
a hood on a um, on a large Chevy truck. So this is this is the engine. The engine's down here. This is the the hood up here. And this is a rotational spring that I saw, and I was like, man, I gotta take a picture of that. But you don't see very many rotational springs very often. How many of these do you ever see on a structure? You ever seen one? No, I, I not really. Sometimes I see them on kids' toys, right, where they go back and forth, like on McDonald's, right? The ones that rock back and forth over and over again. Sometimes those are rotational springs. But believe it or not, every single connection we deal with is a rotational spring. And we'll find. We'll talk more about that coming up. It may not look like one, but it's going to act like one, and that's kind of what the or what we're going to get to with, the, with, with this lecture. What is the shear diagram for this structure? What's it look like? Oh, you're right. It goes up here and down here. Dr. Russell is so proud of you, right? How about this one? What's it going to look like? The same. The exact same. What's this one going to look like? Actually, somewhat depends on the. Um, well, these are rotational springs, not shear, not shear springs. When you'll find as you take one more advanced analysis classes, you can have rotational springs, shear springs, axial springs, all kinds of springs. Okay, they're all possible. But if these are just rotational springs, what's the shear diagram going to look like? Oh, you're right. The same. The exact same. All three are the exact same. Why? Because the shear stiffness is the same between all three of these connectors. Shear stiffness. Not bending stiffness. None of these three connectors allow displacement. If they don't allow displacement, then we assume they're infinitely stiff. Now, does that happen in real life? Do we have infinitely stiff structures? You pile on all the loads you want and they never move. Does that ever happen? No. That's make-believe. But it sure the hell makes the math a lot easier if we assume it's that way. Okay? That's what we often do. Okay, what is the moment diagram for this? Who knows? Parabola. What's the value? The center. Yeah, that should be like my name is, and then you should be able to say WL squared over 8. Okay, it is that inherent to your DNA as a structural engineer to know that number. And if you don't, you better get it in your DNA. Okay? How about this one? What's it going to look like? Same thing, but shifted down. That's right. Inverted parabola. What? Yeah. What are the values? Are they, is it higher in the middle or at the edge? What's the value at the edge? W L squared over 12. What's it at the middle? I'm just going to assume you guys are having a sleepy Monday, okay? Because if you don't know these things, you're not going to pass this class, okay? W L squared over what? 24. I mean, this is basic, essential stuff. Okay? You should already know. I've seen it. I know you've seen it in my classes, and I know you've seen it in structural analysis and other classes. You should just know it. Now, what's going to happen on the partially restrained structure?
in between. We know it's somewhere between 0 and wl squared over 12 on both sides. And we know in the middle it's somewhere between wl squared over 24 and wl squared over 8. We could actually draw, if we wanted to, two different parabolas and they would perfectly offset one another and we know that with a rotational spring we have to be somewhere in between those two has to be <clears throat> and we also know that let's say I pick this one let's let's say for now make to make it easy that the that the stiffnesses are the same and if I draw diagram here, what's my absolute value here have to be? It's got to be W squared over 8. Absolute value, because that's what we call this total static moment. Okay. That's what the shear diagram is doing, is it's forcing you integrate the shear diagram to get the moment diagram. You're you're placing the load from the shear diagram on top of the moment diagram. You're forcing it to move, forcing it to do these things. If they're all the same, they absolutely have to be parallel, right? Just shift it, okay? Now, if they're not the same over here, then this can move a little bit, okay? This can change a little bit. These edges can move a little bit up and down. Still, they have to be within this, this, this range. And what you're going to find... And, and I'll just tell you right now, the last thing that, that we talk about, what, what you're going to find in this class and in real life, that nothing is truly a pin or fixed. Nothing is. But things are close to being a pin, and we're just going to make our lives easier and call it a pin. And things are close to being fixed, and we're going to make our lives easier and call it fixed. And the things in the middle... If you really want to, and you're a masochist, you know what masochist means? It means you love pain, then you can try to make it a rotational spring. But I didn't tell you to do it. Okay? You're going to assume it's a pin. Why? Because it's conservative. It's always conservative to, to ignore stiffness. Okay? So I've told you the answers. We're going to be going through this again. If you didn't quite get it, don't worry. You're going to hear it again. Okay? Let's see this again. This is a concept a lot of people have a hard time getting straight in their heads, so work on it. All right? All right.